Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to United Methodist Church. I'm Gail Adams. I'm your liturgist. This is George Finley. He is our minister today. And will you be ministering down in... Uh... I will not. You're not? I will be ministering here. Here? Okay, George is here. What? Oh, and Austin Finley, that's George's son. Isn't he handsome? <laughs> the call to worship. Please join... Are they joining me in the call to worship? Yes. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephira, who are one of the little clans of Judea, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Oh, we already did that, didn't we? Together. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. The opening hymn is O oh, Worship the King, number 73, verses 1 and 2. And my Redeemer lives.
Did George pay, play the heck out of that piano? I couldn't even hear myself sing. He played so well. Yes! Thank you, George. I know I don't have a very good singing awesome. voice. Oh, Austin's <laughs> rocking out. Thank you, Austin. Um, it's time for announcements, and my announcement is that we are so, so busy getting the Parsonage ready to rent out. It's, it's got a new paint job on the inside, thanks to Austin. Jake and Austin are working on re-roofing re the roof where there was a hole from a vent. They're moving the vent for the stove out. They're lifting the water heater. They're putting a drain pan under. They're attaching new switch plates. Jake, Steve got all new switch plates, all new light fixtures. And they're putting those in. They're caulking the bathtub. They're fixing the wall. They're reinstalling the disposal. They're fixing it to the thing. They're cleaning the yard. They're doing the gutters for a thousand bucks. We're going to move back in. Yeah. <laughs> it's well worth it. Tanya, do you have a question? Yes, I do. What? I know, I know, Tanya, I know what you're talking about, and I'm sorry, but Huber is doing this, and you know that they're going to charge first, last, middle, and it's so expensive. I, I just, right. I'm sorry, honey. Okay. Uh, another happy thing is that Chuck, our cleaner, the guy who cleans everything, I talked to him last week, and I said, Chuck, you know, you should get us a new vacuum cleaner. So he went and got it, and I came by. He was so happy. He goes, look at this. It's the cleanest the rug's ever been. So... And it was only 70 bucks. Amazing that $70 can make anyone so very happy. <laughs> Jake and Austin are going to be working all this week on it. We have Hoover, like I said, is doing the rental. And we've had lots of people asking about renting it. But it's hard for us to, to do the rental ourselves. It's better to have an agency. Uh, and, and it's funny because uh, Jacob on, got on the roof and he took down four satellite dishes. I'm thinking George is getting messages from God <laughs> down into the satellite. Why does he need four satellite dishes? George, are you getting the message? She, uh, I'll tell you what, she should have been in drama. Have you noticed? <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what's going on. Anything else? This, this, that, this. Nope, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions after church about the rental, don't ask me. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> And any other announcements? Yes, David. All right. Very nice. Very good, Ruth. One thirty on Monday. Here. And David, did you have an announcement? David, do you have an announcement? Oh, men's breakfast Saturday. Yeah. Eight thirty. TJ's. Okay. Any. Nine more what? Really, for the rest of our lives, or what? <laughs> oh. Any other announcements, George? Yeah, uh, a couple of them. Just a reminder of the free guitar class that I'm starting March 7th at 7 p.m. at Placer Hills. And uh, I've gotten probably, I, I, I'm expecting anywhere from about 30 to 40 people. Oh, my god! Yeah, a ton of people are inquiring. And what's really cool is I'm getting a lot of parents who want their... 12, 13, 14 year old kids to come yeah. and take lessons. Yeah. So I'm super excited about that. Uh, not only is it a great community type thing, but it's also in, you know, I have ulterior motives. It's uh, an outreach, you know, I'm just yes. hoping, I'm not gonna be preaching the gospel, you know, or anything like that. It's just, uh, it, it's a, an opportunity for them to come into one of our buildings, feel mm -hmm. familiar with the building, feel loved, and possibly maybe come and play guitar with me in Austin. Wouldn't that be All great? Right. Yes, and they'll be able to see that you are a real person, George. I am real. <laughs> I am real. Part, parts of me. Uh, but <laughs> also, um, please pray. Bible study, Psalm study is canceled this week. I'm going down to get the, uh, to Arizona to get the house ready to rent. So that's going to be uh, a wonderful oh, thing. Oh, George, I was going to come this week, too. What's that? I said I was going to come and join it. Sure you were. Right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I was kidding. She went for the longest time, but she called me, said she was bored, so she stopped coming. But <laughs> Oh, George, you know that's not true. Yeah, so don't show, Moving up, on. don't show up. No song study this Wednesday at Placerville. All right. So. Thanks, George. Anything else? No, that's it. All right. Uh, I oh, sorry. Ruth? 
Oh, good, Wally. So this is the only one you're going to be able to go to, huh? Well, good, Wally. I'm sure she's glad that you came. Thank you. Okay, confession and gratitude. Please join us in confession and gratitude and quit raising your hands. It's time for joys and concerns. Yes. Yes. Awesome. We're so happy to have you. What a wonderful joy. So let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise be to God. Yes, George. What's your name again? Chris. Chris. Okay, uh, we're going to keep Chris in our prayers this week. Let uh, Lord in your mercy, oh God, hear our prayers. And Sabella? All right. Nice. That's a wonderful joy. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise, Praise be to God. Any other joys and concerns? Yes. Yay! Wow. All right. She was, was burnt out of her home this last, when the fire broke out here in Colfax, and just now getting back into that house. What a joy. Yeah, so let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise be to God. More joys and concerns? Yes, Rosie? He's fine. He's fine. 
Oh, good. All right, the bottom line is he's good. So let us give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Praise be to God. I have joy. Yes. So a couple of joys. First of all, um, mom, you know, she had the slurred speech, and so I rushed her to the urgent care, and they say go to the emergency room, so I took her in, and um, it turned out that, for those of you who don't know, she had a UTI with E. coli, and that explains the really, really sore back, and then also the kind of brain stuff that's going on. She's still pretty slow. It's, it's, it's noticeable to me, anyway. So keep mom in prayer, but that's a joy that she's right. uh, in, not in, in as much pain. And the other joy is, last night, I had the privilege to go watch Austin compete in a professional arm wrestling tournament, and it was down in Ripon, and he, well, here's how it works. So left-handed, he got, what, third place. Right-handed, he got second place, but then the dude didn't show up to the finals, and he got first place. <laughs> so... I mean, we're talking, this was a big thing, and I got him on video. Maybe I'll put them together and send out the link. It was oh. so inspiring. Wow, good So job. I am a little hoarse today because I was screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so if you notice it during the message, that's what happened. So, All right. Praise be to God. All right, that is a joy. We're s <laughs> yeah. If you keep coming to the church, he may show you the muscle. So you want to keep coming. <laughs> Don't miss it. He's got a giant Popeye muscle over there. Um, so that's a huge joy. Uh, let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Any other joys? Yes, Susie? I just want prayers for a couple people in my life. My recovery. Okay. So prayers for those uh, people who you love and care for. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, oh God, hear our prayers. David. Okay, that's a good prayer, or a good thought there, David. So, Lord, in your mercy, oh God, hear our prayers. Yes, Lisa? Oh, our dear Vicki has a cold. Let's pray for her. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, oh God, hear our prayers. Anything else? Anyone? David, you got another one? Yes, we're happy Amen. to have Tanya, Tanya back. Thanks for coming, Tanya. We're glad that you're well. We are. Lord, oh, let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise be to God. Yes, Carolyn. Yes, we are very thankful to have Ruth in our congregation who brings us food every week. Thank you. All right. So let us give thanks to the Lord for that. Praise, Praise be to God. God. All right. Moving on. The song of confession is the solid rock. Did we already do that? Yep. Oh, we already did that. Uh, then a prayer to the Lord. Psalms 132, verses 7 through 11. We're going to do it together. Here we go. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Raise up, O Lord, and go to your resting place. You and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your faithful shout for joy. For you, servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body, I will set on your throne. Amen. And now, and now, the ushers are, please come forward.
The hymn of preparation is Leading on the Everlasting Arm, verses 1 and 3. I just want to say what a wonderful group of people we have here today. I'm, I'm happy to worship with all of you. I do want to do one thing. It was so fun, though, because uh, my nephew, Davey, went along with us, and we drove and just had four hours of great conversation in the car. It was awesome. We were laughing our heads off, making fun of my nephew's big ears. It was super cool. <laughs> Where was the competition? Uh, in Ripon. Yeah, and they were celebrating the al uh, al Almond. <laughs> Say that right? Al al <laughs> almond Festival. Yeah, and there were tons of people there, but I had never seen so many at an arm wrestling tournament. That was really cool. Really, really cool. Well, good morning. This is part four. Uh, we didn't, George preached last week, so um, I'm getting you caught up with Placer Hills. Part four in the book of Ruth. And I have been having a blast, personally. But preachers always enjoy their messages, oftentimes more than parishioners do. So... If you're not enjoying it, just don't tell me. <laughs> All right, let's just do a little review and work our way through this, kind of remind us of this beautiful story. It's a, a gorgeous story. Um, I, I can honestly say this is probably in my top five favorite series that I've ever preached. It really is because you see so much, believe it or not, of Jesus and his sovereignty in the lives of these people who lived just about 1,100 years before he was born. Of course, we know that Christ is the word of God and he's always existed. The Bible says in the beginning was the word, logos, right? And the word, John 1, 1, 1, 2, it says, and the word was with God and the word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. <clears throat> That's the story of what we call the incarnation. God loved us so much that he came down in the form and fashion of humanity. The Word of God says in Philippians, he was made in the likeness 
of humanity and took upon him, the Bible says, a form of a servant. And that's one thing we've been seeing in the book of Ruth, especially her and Boaz. They were loving each other, caring for one another, serving one another, honoring one another. So the characters, just a brief reminder, <clears throat> there was a famine in the land, and there was a man named Elimelech. And he was married to this woman named Naomi. They had two kids, Malon, Chilion. And what happened was, is there was a huge famine, and so they took off on a 50-mile journey from Bethlehem down to enemy territory, Moab, to dwell with Moabites. In other words, it was a division. There was a spirit after World War II that made us angry with the Japanese, made us angry with the Germans. There was a spirit after 9-11 that made us angry with the Arabs, right? And supposedly we came together in 9-11, supposedly we came together in 1945, 1946, and thereafter. But what constitutes real unity? If we look around, the unity that we have seen in this country is always, it's always been temporary. And suddenly, the polarizing forces split up again, right? We united, everything felt so great, waving American flags, thinking, man, we're on our journey to healing. But it never happens because it is not rooted in the love of Christ. It's rooted in the cessation of war. Now we pray. Thank you, Dave. We pray for the cessation of war. We're not taking sides. We don't do that. We're not on the side of Putin. We're not on the side of Russia or Ukraine or Hamas, you know, Palestine or Israel. We are on the side of Christ because that keeps us praying for them. We want all of them to come to know the love of Christ. Because Jesus says it is that love of Christ that bonds us together, binds us together. The Bible says, in Christ you are all one. The word of God says that the blood of Christ has made of Jew and Gentile one new creation. And the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You've had me, heard me quote this almost ad nauseum, but you can't really quote the Bible ad nauseum. The Bible shouldn't make us nauseous. These wonderful verses that tell us who we are in Jesus, that he sees us as a new creation, he sees us as his bride, and that he reminds us that he came here to serve us, it warms our heart. And he said, the Son of Man, Jesus said this in his earthly life, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and what? Give his life a ransom. He ransomed us. He paid the price to get us back to himself. He wanted you so badly that he would rather die, as an old pastor used to teach, he would rather die than live without you. conquered death, conquered separation from God, and gave you eternal life through faith in him. So when they go down to Moab, the two sons marry a couple of Moabites. And they weren't supposed to, according to Old Testament law, right? They weren't supposed to marry these Gentiles at the time. This is under the Old Testament. And so what ends up happening is... We get to chapter 2, and this is after Elimelech dies, Naomi's husband, and her two sons. Malon and Kilian are now dead, and so is her husband. She's grieving. This woman is grieving. This is a woman, a Jew, who loves God dearly. But, as we know, when sorrows come, especially the loss of a loved one, it can cause us to have faulty thinking about the Lord. And even to the point where Naomi said, God's hand 
is what? Against me. George quotes a passage often, and it's one of my favorites. It's not the Ephesians one. I know I uh, dote about that one. It's just wonderful, but it's in Romans, and we read it often together when George preaches. And it says what? It, Romans 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? Amen? God is never against you. You're his children. That would, to, to, to be against us would be antithetical or contrary to his nature. It would be contrary to the nature of his promises. The nature of his love, which is deep and it's everlasting. The Bible calls God's love everlasting. It would be contrary. It would be like me saying to my son, I am now against you. If, if God were to be against us. Imagine if suddenly I said, I am against my son. He is my enemy. I am pushing him aside. There are many people, even within the UMC, who would like to teach that somehow one day we could fall out of God's grace. Something to separate ourselves from the love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of God, George? No one. No one. He says, no created thing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Get all Pentecostal. You know what I mean? I mean, that's worthy of shouting. <laughs> Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Not even you. Right? That's why Jesus said, again, no one shall snatch you out of my Father's hand. No one shall snatch you out of my hand, Jesus says. I and the Father are one. And they picked up stones to throw at him. And he said, why are you stoning me for all the good works which I've shown you? And they said, we don't stone you for your good works. We stone you because you being a man make yourself God. And Jesus is basically your darn to you. My people are in my hand. And as Chuck Swindoll said one time, you can jump around, remember, you can jump around from knuckle to knuckle, but you cannot jump out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I have a feeling all of us have experienced all the knuckles of God. <laughs> you ever been jumping around, anxious? This has been the week from hell for me, for mom. No, not really. It's more the week from purgatory. Not quite. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it's been a gnarly week. It has been a really gnarly week, okay? Some setbacks, as you all know. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've had some setbacks. You all know I'm in recovery, and it is such a drag. It is such a drag to have to get up here before you and say that. It's painful, Wally. It's painful that when we allow tragedy to Take our eyes off Christ and forget about his love and resort to crutches. It's painful. But Jesus is so good to us. He's so good. He loves us. I know I'm going to lose my mom one day. I know that physically. But it's heavy. It is sad. It's very sad. So I'm sorry to bring my problems into this, but... Ruth's story is so beautiful because she thought the Lord's hand was against her. And we immediately place ourselves in her dear heart. And we understand what it's like to feel like God is against us. You feel it. He's never against you, but we feel it sometimes. So she's down there with Naomi. There's this brother-in-law named Boaz. And then there were these leader reapers and Naomi's encouraging Ruth to go find a dude. It's beautiful. It's a love story, a loving mother. Go find a wonderful man. Look for a man whose heart is fixed upon the Lord. And Boaz tells all of his Reapers, keep your hands off this woman, Ruth. Hands off. And they knew better than to violate that. Ruth gleans, remember? 
gleaming. It's kind of like cruising dudes. I know that sounds kind of irreverent, but that's what's going on. Naomi's saying, go, go shop. We'll play the song, you better shop around. Uh-huh. My mama told me, right? Boaz protects her. Reapers obey. Ruth, so, so much honoring Boaz and Boaz honoring her. I think love is awakening. It's awakening. You know how it is. I mean, real courtship. Not having sex on the first date. Not the second date. Courting. The Bible teaches us courting. Get to know that person. We live in a society now which says, yeah, it, unite physically first to see if it's going to work. And if it don't, see you later. But here we see this beautiful story of courting. Where it's get to know her. Get to know her heart. Get to know him, his heart. Figure out who the real person is. God spoke of the woman's heart. And he says, of that hidden person of the heart, which is of in the sight of God. Are you ready for this? It describes the hidden person of the heart. And speaking of a, a woman, the hidden person of the heart as of great price in the sight of God. And that same Greek phrase Jesus used when he described the pearl of great price. You were the pearl of great price. And Jesus sold all that he had in his death to buy this pearl of great price. That's the same Greek phrase that Peter uses to describe the hidden person in this woman's heart, which is a great price in the sight of God. Isn't that beautiful? So she gives Ruth dating advice. She does. Ruth meets Boaz at midnight. Oh, what a temptation. Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night. Naomi basically says, go hang out by his feet. Catch him after he's had a little bit to drink. He's content. He's had something to eat. He falls asleep, wakes up at midnight, and there's this honorable woman who's uncovered his feet. I know that's kind of weird. It's just a cultural thing. It's weird. But he wakes up. And remember he said, whoa. Yes. In my story he did. <laughs> Why can't you guys read the Bible like I do? I'm like, this is juicy. It is juicy. You know, sometimes I feel like, you know, we're so used to this weird liturgical reading of the scriptures where we're all just, you know, uh, practically reading Latin. You know, and reading the Bible like, Stoically, I read the Bible as the vibrant, living word that God has given us. And it makes me feel the story. It makes me feel compassion. When we read the Bible with this mechanical, stoic mindset, I think sometimes we can lose compassion. We can lose a tenderheartedness, a sensitivity that we all should have to those characters because then it translates into our own lives. And how do we embrace each other's hearts when we're struggling? He continues to honor Ruth. She continues to honor him. And then finally, and so beautifully, he honors Ruth's mother. He says, go back to Naomi with these, all this barley. I want you to know that I respect your mama. Boys, respect mothers, respect fathers, respect their blessing. You are not an island, new couples. You're not an island. You need advice. You need those parents who know their daughter better than you could ever know her. They have seen her spirit as they've raised her. They know what she's like. They know what she needs. Be respectful. I wish I could say I was always respectful in that department. 
Well, then they were waiting on the answer. Remember what happened. Boaz was so honorable. He could have had this wonderful woman right then. Ruth, beautiful, noble. Her reputation, hers and Naomi's reputation, was all around the land. Everybody knew. And Boaz still said to Ruth and Naomi, yeah, I would love to do it. I would love to just take you as my wife and take all this property and everything. But I know deep down there's someone that is more closely related biologically than I am, which was that, that they were supposed to do that. And so he asked this next of kin, and they're waiting for the answer. And he says, nah. At first, he was all excited about the land, but then when he found out he had to take on a wife, he was like, eh, that's too much money. <laughs> that was really his thinking. You can read it. Read it in the text. Read the fine print. All right, here we go. Chapter 4. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there ne to the next of kin, of whom Boaz had spoken, came passing by. Boaz said, come over, friend. Sit down here. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the elders. He wanted witnesses for this contract. This is going to be a contract. You know, that's what, that's what we do in weddings, right? Contrary to popular opinion, you don't show up to weddings for the reception and the drinks. That's what we've done to weddings today. We've turned it into this big old reception. You know, go there, see that, you know, have the nice feelings about going up to the altar, maybe a little giggling and stuff like that. Or if you look at some viral videos, you see this one woman just laughing hysterically because the guy pronounced the vows wrong or something. The purpose, all those people are to go there is what? To be what? Witnesses to never take one side or the other once they're married. Never. The purpose of that, those, those witnesses, was to support them now because they are what? One. And we live in this weird society where we hear the gossip of one side of the marriage, and now it, 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 it takes our minds and makes us biased against the other side. The first thing that should happen when you hear one side coming to you is, you know what? Let's find some of those people who attended that ceremony. Let's find a couple, two or three, four or five, and let's sit down together. The man, the woman, the witnesses. And let's talk over this and let's pray over it and let's seek counsel from the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who is so intimately acquainted with your soul and so loves you and wants this, what God has joined together, what? Let no one separate. Goodness. I wish we had that mindset today. So, takes 10 of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of kin, Naomi, here's the fine print. This is good. You can see it. Boaz is it's interesting. Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman, Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of the people. If you will redeem it, redeem it, but if you will not, tell me so that I may know, for there is no one prior to you to redeem it. And I come after you. In other words, you're the closest of kin. So he said, I will redeem it. All he's heard now is about the land. Then Boaz said, the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth. <laughs> A woman comes along with it. You know what I mean? It's like buying a used BMW. It's got a lot of status, but the problem's lurking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I, you know, you know what happens when you buy a used BMW or Jaguar. You know, it's a ten, fifteen thousand dollar repair right after you get it. That happened to me with a Land Rover. I bought a lemon. I'm not saying that about Ruth. That guy missed out. You will be acquiring Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name. 
on his inheritance. But this next of kin was so selfish, he couldn't handle that. I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. So there's his selfishness. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times of Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. That's just like shaking hands in our culture. Same thing, it's just different cultures, that's all. They were Birkenstock. <laughs> so when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, Ruth is mine. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe in his mindset. Today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilean and Malon's two deceased sons. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malon, to be my wife. Meditate on that. You are called the wife of Jesus, the church. Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as... Say it louder. Because Christ loved the church. And what? Gave himself for her. Man, if we had that spirit of Christ, we wouldn't be arguing over patriarchalism, egalitarianism, complementarianism. We would be talking about the love of Christ and honoring one another. That's what it takes, whether it's a business relationship, a familial relationship, a marital relationship. We honor one another as Christ honored the church and we now honor him. To maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. And that's the servant's heart of Boaz. He's going to be fathering a child through Ruth to be raised for Naomi and Elimelech. Not his own. That's a servant's heart. It would be as if I had no Fenleys after me or something and, 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 and I deeply wanted my name to be carried on but then had to do it for someone else which required all of his inheritance. Then all the people who were at the gate along with the elders said, we are witnesses. Keep that in mind next time you go to a wedding. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. What happened there? All kinds of weird stuff with Jacob and Rachel and Leah. He wanted to marry Rachel, Jacob did, but he honored Laban, the dad, and he said, after seven years, I'll give her to you. Instead, he gives Leah, who had the cock eyes, you know, the cross eye like that. But he wakes up, realizes it's not Leah because of those weird cultural things they had back then, the veil. And he says, I wanted Rachel. And Laban says, work for me another seven years and I'll give her to you. Wow, what a devoted Jacob. He waited 14 years to get Rachel. Talk about courtship, amen? What boys today would do that? You know, go up to the parents. Hey, I would like to at least have the decency to ask. I would like to date, court your daughter. Maybe not say date. I challenge you, whoever they are, tell your grandkids, tell your kids. When, when that boy goes up to that girl and he kind of has some feelings, some butterflies, and they've been getting to know each other, encourage that boy to go up to those parents and say, you know, I would love to court your daughter. Would you grant me that grace, that privilege? And I commit to getting to know her mind, her heart. So there's Rachel and Leah who built up the whole house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrathah, right? Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Remember that from Micah. Out of you, 
Bethlehem Ephrathah, is he whose goings were of old who will be governor. That's Jesus. Watch, this gets so good. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom what? Tamar bore to Judah. They're bringing up the stereotypes, the stigma. Tamar was a prostitute. Is everybody seeing it? In other words, that was a weird situation with Jacob and Rachel and Leah. It was odd. It was awkward. And then they bring up, made this weird union of Boaz, 80 years, her se- or 40 years her senior. He was 80. Ruth was 40. They're getting married. She's a Moabite, a total pagan. He's a Jew. And so he's going to make love to his wife, this pagan, to give this child to Naomi to raise it for Elimelech. That's unconscionable. That would be unconscionable. That's like how a lot of people felt in the Bible Belt in the South about marrying an African American. Right? That's how it was. You've got you to gotta internalize that weird racist spirit that's going on. And they're all saying, you know what? May God bless it. Just like he blessed the prostitute bearing a child that led to us today. We're going to see something right here and we'll finish up. When they came together, read between the lines, the Lord made her conceive. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord made her conceive. It wasn't random chance. It wasn't good luck. The Lord gives life. Amen. And she bore a son. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, ah, this is so beautiful, who is more to you than seven sons. She just lost her two kids. Then Naomi took the child, laid her in her bosom. Her mother-in-law now has her own child. This is so awesome. And became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. She bore King David's grandfather. You get it? This is rad. I mean, this is radical because Jesus was promised to David to come from his line. And yet one of Jesus' ancestors is a prostitute and one of them is a total pagan. So it has nothing to do with biology, amen? Our relationship has to do with what Jesus has done for us. We're his children. And the Bible says this. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, barbarian nor Scythian, male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's stand as we sing this wonderful song, the refrain, the solid rock. And let's just, while we're singing it, sing it with all your might, all your voice, in tune and out of tune. Doesn't matter. The Lord hears your heart and meditate on what we've learned in Ruth and how sovereign God is to bless us and call us his children through what Christ has done.
to show the world how grateful to Jesus we are by loving one another and loving them. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you.